So the third technique that I want to talk about is, if you like, the least known, the Cinderella of the Three Sisters, and that's MEG, MEG, Magnetoencephalography, which translates as Magnetic Brain Writing. And MEG is, if you like, the successor to the technique of EEG, Electric Brain writing and that is one that most people have come across and a lot of people may even have had an EEG study done on them. Um, you get a lot of electrodes, you put it on your head, it measures your brain waves and a whole lot of stuff comes from that, some of it more dubious than others but basically EEG is an old technique, a workhorse technique, it's been around for over a century and it's proved its worth. However, it has problems and to solve some of those problems people started thinking about whether they could measure the brain's magnetic fields. As you know, electricity and magnetism are two sides of the same coin. Unfortunately, the brain's magnetic fields are tiny. If you get a whole load of neurons firing together, they'll produce a magnetic field that is about something like a trillionth of a Tesla, which is about 50 million times weaker than the Earth's magnetic field. So we are talking incredibly tiny fields here, tiny changes, and that we can measure them is one of the great unsung achievements of modern science. It's a phenomenal achievement, it really is. Because these magnetic changes are literally a much more direct measure of brain activity than even EEG because in EEG the waves are filtering out, they're coming out, through, you're measuring on the surface of the head, you've got the hair, you've got the skull, you've got the brain membranes, the meninges, all of that is getting in the way and there's also a whole lot of other stuff going on in the brain that's distorting the signal. So EEG is not a great measure, it's you know it's not bad and it's a lot quicker than fMRI because you're measuring the electrical activity directly rather than having to actually you know wait for the blood to come in in response to the neurons activity and wait for the neurons to take the fuel and all that sort of stuff that's a lot slower EEG is much quicker but MEG is even more accurate so how does it work well who knows basically because not many people actually understand quantum mechanics and MEG uses quantum mechanics it uses two quantum phenomena, both of them incredibly interesting and rather mysterious. The first is superconductivity. Now superconductivity, which at the moment has to be done at very low temperatures, is a very odd phenomenon and to explain it I need to say a little bit more about the physics. If you get a metal, a metal has a regular atomic structure so the atoms are all lined up in, if you like, neat rows. At room temperature, those atoms are constantly moving. They're jiggling about. So if you get an electron flowing through them, chances are it's going to be knocked out of sync by the atoms that are jiggling about. And those electrons and atoms interact, and that disrupts the electrons. And that phenomenon is called resistance, electrical resistance. And that's why you're constantly getting losses so the electricity that leaves the power station is degraded, if you like, and is not reaching your house, and it's degraded again before it gets into your computer or whatever it happens to be. So resistance is basically a waste of energy, because the energy is dissipated as heat, because when the electrons collide with the atoms, then heat is given off, and that's energy that you could have been using in your computer that has gone to waste. As you cool the metal down, the atom stop well they don't stop jiggling they reduce they they jiggle less so there's more chance for electrons flowing through as a current to get through okay but if you cool it below a, a certain point something very odd happens the electrons drop into a state called a Cooper pair and in that state which is only seen at these very odd low temperatures they effectively become, it's as if the atoms become invisible. They can just flow. There's no resistance. And you see it, if you plot a graph of resistance, it goes down and down and down as the temperature, and then it hits the superconducting transition, and it's gone. No resistance. So if you set an electron wave flowing around a superconducting ring, 
theoretically it should flow forever because there's no loss. So that's superconductivity and that's one of the two techniques that these um, magneto, magneto encephalography scanners, MEG scanners, use. The second is an equally peculiar quantum phenomenon called tunnelling. And to think of that, you have to stop thinking of electrons as little point particles, the way I talked about the proton as being a point particle. That's a convenient fiction, if you like. But in fact, electrons are kind of smudged and smeared. They, they are more like, well, it's called an electron wave function, and that's because it looks more like a wave. And what that means, it's spread out. The wave is a wave of probability, so it tells you mathematically how likely the electron is to be at that point at any one time. So if you have electrons flowing around a metal ring, for example, what you get is a sort of smudgy effect. Now this metal ring is the basis of what's called a squid, a superconducting quantum interference device, and those squids are arranged all around the head and they are the basis of the MEG scanner. Okay, so if you get a squid, you get this electron wave flowing round and round it in the superconducting quantum quantum state. I know squids, I mean it's just So the electron waveform is flowing around the metal ring and the next step is to use that to measure the brain's tiny magnetic fields. How do you do that? Well, the way you do it is this. You insert a little tiny gap and that gap is set in the metal ring but because of quantum tunnelling the electrons flow on as if the gap isn't there. You actually use two gaps and these gaps are called Josephson junctions after the Nobel winning laureate who came up with them, Brian Josephson. So you have this ring with these two little tiny gaps and you can then put a current across each of those gaps, an external current called a bias current and that is what you actually measure in MEG. Okay, so you've got this ring, the two little gaps and the current across each of the gaps, the bias current. Now as the electron is in its superconducting state and the electron wave is just flowing round and round the ring there's no resistance across those gaps of course there isn't because it's superconducting and so you just get a constant bias current however if you then put all this lot which is after all electromagnetic next to a brain which is generating tiny magnetic fields those magnetic fields are going to interfere when they interfere they collapse the superconducting state of the electron every time they change. So what a MEG scanner is measuring is not absolute magnetic fields, it's measuring the change. Every time one of those magnetic fields changes in the brain, you're then going to get a change. It collapses the electron waveform that's flowing around the superconducting ring. That makes the resistance jump across the two Josephson junctions, which changes the bias current and that bias current change is what is measured by a MEG scanner. And when I say, you know, that bias current, obviously there are loads of them because they're arranged all around the head. And so those bias currents can be measured and that is the basis of what you get out of a MEG scanner.